Welcome once again. We are now at Luke chapter 11, verse, verses 29 to 32, the sign of Jonah. Now, what does this mean? Well, we're going to get deep into this. <laughs> you know, get ready for a good little meal here. It's not going to be just a little snack. We're going to have a quick, good meal piece of meat here, okay? Get ready. Let's read this uh, verse 29. When the multitudes were gathered together to him, that's coming, you know, gathered together to Jesus, he began to say, this is an evil generation. <laughs> oh, I got to stop here for just a second. Can you imagine back in those days how much better it was than it is today? <sighs> If Jesus back then, 2,000 years ago, you know, approximately 2,000 years ago, he said, this is an evil generation, how much more evil do we have it today? How much more evil is this generation today? Very much more evil than I, I dare say that it was back then. Wow, we've got some pretty wicked stuff going on right down our streets and pretty much in every home almost. This is an evil generation, Jesus said. It seeks after a sign. Okay? So, so he's pointing to the, the evil, if I can use the word, the evilness of a person whose attitude is, show me a sign. Show me a sign. Prove it. Okay? Jesus says this kind of attitude is evil. No sign, he says, will be given to it but the sign of Jonah or Jonah, the prophet. Well, what's the sign of Jonah, the prophet? Let's read on. Verse 30. For even as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so the Son of Man will also be to this generation. Again, let me stop here for a second. Jesus likens himself to the prophet Jonah. And rightly so in many ways. I mean, Jonah was called to Nineveh to preach repent. Actually, he wasn't just preaching repentance. He, re he preached the judgment is coming. The judgment of God is coming. Jesus, it says the first thing he said was repent. Uh, all the way through his ministry, it was all about repentance. Repentance of sin. Repentance of, from uh, hypocrisy. The last words to his church in the book of Revelation chapter 3 and chapters 2 and 3 were repent. It sounds a lot like the Old Testament prophets, and indeed he is uh, a fulfillment of these prophets. Jesus' message was and still is repentance. So, again, verse 30, For even as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so the Son of Man will also be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in judgment with the men of of this generation and will condemn them for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the w wisdom of Solomon. Now, again, let's just stop here for a second. What's he talking about? Let's get into this. The queen of the south. This is referring to the queen of Sheba or the queen of Ethiopia. Okay. We know by Ethiopian uh, history that her name is even, we know, we even know, her, excuse me, we even know her name, Mekeda. Queen Mekeda. They call it, she's called the Queen of the South. Uh, she's called the Queen of Sheba, uh, the Queen of uh, Ethiopia. But in Ethiopian uh, his, history, she's known as Queen Mekeda. That's her personal name. But she, you see, Jesus is saying that the Queen of the South, Ethiopia, traveled well, he says she came from the ends of the earth, okay? Again, this is, a, this is an expression. This is not a literal, the ends of the earth, but this is an expression. So she came from Ethiopia to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So she heard that there was a, a king or a prophet in Israel by the name of Solomon or Shloma or Shlomo um, in, her, in his original Hebrew. And that he's a man of God and that he's a, God, he's a man through whom God has given much godly and, you know, heavenly wisdom. So she traveled a great distance considering, you know, she didn't have an airplane to travel in. She didn't have a car to jump into. She traveled a great distance just to get to where Solomon was, to see him face to face, to see for herself, to meet him. 
She traveled literally over land and sea. I mean, it, she went to gr a great extent. She left her own country. The queen left her own country to, to, to embark on this long trip just to see Solomon. Jesus said again, verse 31, The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and will condemn, condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, one greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is obviously speaking of himself. Now, once again, keep it in context. Jesus also says that he is meek, you know, and lowly. Okay, so a lot of people got a, the wrong idea of what pr what proud pride is in uh, in the eyes of God, arrogance in the eyes of God. Saying that you are who you are is not necessarily pride. Saying uh, that you are greater than a prophet of old is not necessarily pride, and especially in regards to Jesus, it's absolutely true in his case. He was meek. He is meek and lowly, yet he said great things like, one greater than Solomon is here. Like, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let alone, you know, no one who dies will, who, no one who believes in me will, will die, okay? He, he said these great things, yet he still was humble, very humble. Very important to be humble. It's through all of Scripture that that's what, re, that's what God requires of you, to be humble. It says he opposes the, pr the proud. He opposes the proud, the haughty look. He wants you to be humble. Being humble means accepting the fact that you are in sin, if you are. Accepting the fact that you have sinned. Repenting of it. Leaving it. Acknowledging you've made mistakes or that you are in a one big mistake. Listening to people is all about, that's humility, to be able to listen. See, pride just goes on and just yaps off and doesn't listen. But humility says, I'm willing to listen to you. I'm willing to give you time to, to say what you got to say. Let's get back to this, what Jesus is saying here in verse 32. The men of Nineveh will stand up in the judgment with this generation and will condemn it. Once again, let me say this again, because in this day and age with this very corrupt Christianity that we have today on earth, the, the great falling away that the church is experiencing, a lot of people are saying, you know, who are you to judge? Only God judges. Oh, you know, don't judge me. Only God can judge me. That's not what even Jesus is saying here. I mean, go again, you look at verse um, verse uh, 31. He says, the queen of the south, Queen Mechida, will judge this generation. He says in verse 32, the men of Nineveh, the whole, the whole area, the whole, the whole uh, area of Nineveh will stand in the judgment with this generation, stand up in the judgment with this generation. So the Nineveh itself, the whole city will judge this generation. Not just, God, I mean, Jesus could have said, only God will ju judge this generation. Only God will. Mechina, well, you know, she's got her faults. She can't judge. The men of Nineveh, they had their faults. Uh, they had their sin. They needed to repent. They can't judge. That's not what he said. He said, you know, the queen of the south will rise in judgment against this generation. The men of Nineveh, men of Nineveh will stand up in the judgment with this generation and will condemn it. Obviously, Jesus doesn't have a problem with this whatsoever. He's behind it 100%. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, one greater than Jonah is here. In other words, the men of Nineveh, the whole city of Nineveh, is in as much sin as, the, as that is, it was in. Again, you look at the scriptures, you look at the Bible, it's always the cities that are in fallen into sin. You know, normally that's what it is. But Jesus said, look at even Nineveh, the whole great city of Nineveh repented with the preaching of Jonah. Yet one greater than Jonah is here. How much more should you be repent? You should re be repenting a thousand times faster than Nineveh did, but you're not even thinking about it. 
And that's why the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment against this generation. The sign of Jonah. It says in in other parts of the scriptures that Jesus said that just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the heart of in the heart of the fish, so the Son of Man will spe- uh, spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, again, this is not whole twenty four hour periods. Okay, you got to understand the culture and how you know the the way of speech back then. A day could have been you know. Two hours of one day can be considered to be a day. You know, consider the, 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 the parable of, of those who only worked for two hours and those who worked for like 12 hours. Uh, the ones that worked for two hours still got paid for the whole day. And, and the ones that worked for 12 hours got paid for the whole day, the same pay. Um, this is the way of speech back in those days. So three days and three nights doesn't mean three, like literally, you know, 36 hours of, of days, 30, 36 hours of day, 36, or, you know, what I'm talking about. Um, it means basically just three whole or, or part days, okay? So if Jesus did indeed die on Friday, that would be considered to be a day. If Jesus did rest on Saturday, keeping the Sabbath, in rest and death, that would be considered a day. If Jesus rose on Sunday, regardless of the hour, that would still be considered to be a day. Okay? Um, so, that is uh, the sign of Jonah. Uh, one final thought I want to bring to your attention is that the scriptures we have pre-Jesus, okay, before the coming of Christ, or like in the Christian Old Testament, all of those scriptures are there for us to read and to obey and to learn. You think about it, the first century church, the first century church, that's all they had to go by. That's what they used for their text of their sermons. That's what they used for their text of their, uh, of, of their you know, their services. That's what they used of their, for their text of their faith. Okay, was the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament scriptures, or like the Septuagint would have been uh, also, uh, you know, included in that. Um, there's a whole lot of different canons, but, you know, we got the Septuagint, we got other ancient writings that we know that people have uh, read back then and, 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 and went by. We're going to get into all this stuff, okay? We're going to get into the ancient documents, the ancient scriptures that is not found in a lot of Christian Bibles today. We're going to study all this stuff, okay? So make sure you don't uh, forget to always check back. Make sure you subscribe and, um, and always check back uh, because we're going to be doing this you know, as often as we can, we're going to be taking a bite here, a bite there, a bite here. We're going to get wonderful spiritual meals out of this. So in the Old Testament, it's all a, it's like what they say, like a shadow of what's to come. You know, in Isaiah, it says that God tells the end from the beginning. The word beginning there is actually Genesis, Bereshit, Okay. Uh, so God tells you everything that's going to happen in the future. God tells you everything about the future of the world in the book of Genesis. God tells you everything that you need to know, actually, in the Old Testament, okay? And the New Testament is there to prove that, that Jesus was the uh, fulfillment of, of a lot of these prophecies and uh, the living, walking, breathing Word of God. So what you know to be the word of God that's written in, in, in the Old Testament is what we have personified in Jesus. If your, IG, if your idea of Jesus is contrary to the word of God in the Old Testament, you're, ta- you're believing in the wrong Jesus. That's, that's fact. Jesus is the word manifest in the flesh. He is the word personified, as John chapter 1 says. He is the living, breathing word of God. When John wrote that, what was he referring to? He wasn't referring to the New Testament. They didn't even have the New Testament back then. They had the scriptures that preceded the coming of Christ. Lots of things to think about. So Jonah was one of those things. Lots of different... uh, It's like the... 
the scriptures, the old ancient scriptures before the coming of Christ was like a mirage. You ever see one of those pictures where you see a face of somebody, but inside that face, you see the same face or you see the face, another face, you see another face, you see another face and another face, another face. You see like a hundred different faces all in this one face. That's the way it is in the Old Testament. Everything you read in the Old Testament is Jesus. You see Jesus in the whole in the whole scope of Scripture. You see Jesus in the book of Genesis, in the book of Malachi. You see Jesus in the book of Psalms. A lot of Jesus in the book of Psalms. It is His Word. Okay? We see Jesus in Jonah. Okay? And this is what my point is, is that Jonah is another example of that Jesus is actually how will I say it? a fulfillment, not a fulfillment, but um, manifest in the flesh uh, of the past uh, that we have written in the Old Testament. It says what happened before will happen once again. What happened with Jonah happened with Jesus, except even like Jesus said, he was greater than Jonah. Lots of things to think about. So as you go, think about these wonderful truths that we're talking about, the sign of Jonah, how that proves that the Old Testament is a, is basically a blueprint of what Jesus was and also what is to come. Thanks again for watching. God bless you. Show and show you great and mighty things as he enlightens the eyes of your understanding. Thanks again.